technical difficulties, um, welcome to Beating Bartonella, a Lyme co-infection. Um, so this is part two of our webinar series that we've been doing on beating Lyme, hosted by Foundations Wellness Coaching. Um, and we're really glad that you're here. We're excited to jump in. There's a lot of great information to share tonight. Um, I know that obviously if you're here that you are interested in learning more, maybe you yourself battle with this or some that you know or love. Um, so we're really excited just to, to share these things with you. If you missed part one, we'll be sending out a link to the recording of that um, in a follow-up email. Um, and as always, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions, either after watching the part one webinar or after tonight's webinar. Um, a few housekeeping things for us first off. Um, if you can go ahead, and I know you guys have your um, your cameras off already, but you can go ahead and mute your microphones too, just to cut down on any background noise. That would be super helpful. Um, and then if you have any questions throughout that come to mind, feel free to put them in the chat box. So at the end of the presentation, Lisa is going to be taking some questions and she'll be going through them. Um, so don't hesitate to send those. And if afterwards you realize that you had a question, again, don't hesitate to follow up with that. Um, you know, sometimes it takes a little bit of time to think of those things. So a brief disclaimer before we jump into stuff a little bit more. This um, presentation tonight is not intended to serve as medical advice. So you see your medical doctor to treat or cure your medical condition. At Foundations Wellness Coaching, we help you use natural interventions to help your body heal itself. Um, as we before we jump in tonight, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker for the evening. Um, our speaker is Lisa Schumacher. She is a registered nurse, a certified Lyme practitioner at Foundations Wellness Coaching. Um, she's done an uprooting Lyme mentorship with Hillary Thing, and she is a member of ILODS, which is the International Lyme and Associated Disease Society. Um, and as you'll learn tonight, there's a lot of different environmental toxins and things that uh, can affect our system. And she's also a member of ISEAI, which is the International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness. Um, so Lisa is very passionate about what she does, and we are excited for her to share with you all tonight. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Lisa. Thank you so much, Justine. Hi, everybody. Um, for those of you who saw the first video on beating Lyme, I welcome you back. And um, if you are new to my webinars, welcome. I'm really glad to have you. Um, some of the things we're going to talk about today, of course, we're going to talk about Bartonella. Um, we're going to talk about what it is, how you get Bartonella, um, what are some of the ways that we can test for Bartonella, and also um, what, what does some of the treatment look like. Then we're going to look at foundations wellness coaching and what makes us a little bit different than what may possibly other practitioners do. And we're going to go over then um, some things that can block healing, some things like toxins. So in the first podcast or the first webinar that I did, I talked about glyphosate. I talked about mold and mycotoxins and BPA plastic. And um, if you want to know more about that, you can look back at that first webinar I did on beating Lyme. And this time I'm going to be talking, uh, talking about some different toxins. And what I want you to understand is the reason we're talking about the toxins and even Bartonella, and which some of it can seem pretty scary and overwhelming, is just to raise your level of awareness um, so that you can make informed decisions. So whether it's about um, what products you're going to use at home, whether it's about what food you want to eat. I want you to have the tools you need to make those decisions. So if you're ready, we'll get started. Um, so why is this important to me? All right. So these are pictures from when I lived in St. Petersburg, Russia. Two of them are in St. Petersburg. One of them is in Moscow. And when I lived there back in 1994, um, I had two very small children and a very kind Christian woman who had written a series of cookbooks came over to St. Petersburg, Russia to teach missionaries how to eat healthy on the mission field. She was one of those people, her name was Sue Gregg, and she was one of those people who come alongside to help you improve your health. Since then, as I was raising my kids, other people came alongside me and helped me improve my health. That's why I'm here today, because people came alongside me. That's what I wanna do for you. 
I want to be a person that you can reach out to that can come alongside you to give you tools to help you move forward in your health. So here we go. All right, so we're talking about Bartonella, with, which is a stealth infection, which means it's very, uh, very good at hiding. Um, it is a gram-negative alpha proteobacteria, and there are over 30 species of Bartonella, and almost 20 of them have been linked to human infection. Bartonella hides in the erythrocytes, the endothelial cells, microglia, the macrophages, and the CD34 stem cells. Now, just in case you don't know exactly what each of these cells are, let me tell you what each of them is. So the erythrocytes are the red blood cells that contain the, contain the hemoglobin. And this is what gives it its red color. It transports oxygen and carbon dioxide to and from the tissues. So the endothelial cells form the single cell layer that lines the blood vessels. And, and this these cells regulate what passes between the bloodstream and the tissues, really important cells. The microglia are immune cells of the central nervous system. The macrophages are white blood cells and they are an important part of the innate immune system. And the, the CD34 stem cells are the cells that produce mature blood cells. All of these really important cells in our body. So let's move on. So um, in order to grow, Bartonella requires heme, which is part of hemoglobin. And that's found in the red blood cells, one reason that it lives there. Um, it requires oxygen and CO2, which are both found in the bloodstream. And something special about Bartonella is it can live intercellular or extracellular. And this is one of the things that makes it hard to detect in a test and also hard to treat. All right, so what are some of the vectors that transport, that transmit Bartonella? Um, first and the most common are fleas and the feces of fleas. Next, we have bites and scratches of reservoir hosts. This could include cats and dogs and includes many, many other small, small mammals. Um, there might be biting flies, which some are sand flies and horn flies. Um, human body lice can also transmit Bartonella. Ticks can. Thus, we're doing this with Lyme, which is a tick-borne illness. In 1990, it was discovered that ticks could transmit Bartonella. All right. Um, and it can also be transmitted from parent to child. Um, they're pretty sure that it can from a mother to a baby. Um, what I want to point out in this picture. So uh, do you like my picture of my cat? Um, she just happened to be sitting with me when I was studying Lyme disease. Um, very perfect for, for this slide. Um, so when if you find a, a stray cat or a stray dog, but especially cats, and especially if it's a kitten, if it's infested with fleas and those fleas carry Bartonella, think about the cat scratching itself and getting the flea feces under its fingernails. And then think, of, think about you playing with the kitten and getting a scratch. How often do you, if you have a kitten, do you get scratched? I mean, it just happens all the time. So think about this if this was a stray cat whether it's a cat or a kitten, very easy to get scratched. And if they're infested with fleas, which is often common if they're stray, um, Bartonella can be transmitted to you. So this is the most common way worldwide that Bartonella is transmitted. Um, but today um, we're talking about it because it's not uncommon to be transmitted with Lyme um, from a tick. All right, so here are some of the symptoms for Bartonella. And um, so when we think of Bartonella, other than the first, so some of the symptoms are body-wide, but some, especially for Bartonella, are from the neck up. So think about that as we're going through symptoms. So I'll just read through these. So pain 
on the bottom of the feet. This can be like feeling like there's marbles on your feet when you get up in the morning. Um, shin pain. It's common to have headaches. It's Some people have Bart stria, and these look like stretch marks. Have you ever known anybody that had a stretch mark in a really weird place? And you think, I didn't gain and then lose weight in that location. So when I worked at a children's hospital, I had a patient who had a traumatic, traumatic brain injury and a lot of neurological symptoms. And one thing that was interesting about him is he had stretch marks on his thighs. And, and I always remember thinking that was such a weird place for him to have that. All right. So, sorry, I'm going to let somebody in the room. There we go. Um, so that's something that, that if you see stretch marks in odd places, thank Bartonella. Um, joint pain is common, debilitating depression, uncontrolled crying, psychoses, schizophrenia, neuropathies, including nerve pain, internal vibrations and humming. I have a client who has a lot of this, and it is so uncomfortable. Um, neurological tics, similar to Tourette's tooth pain, or atypical history of root canals. In people who have this condition, I hear that dentists are doing root canals and they don't even know why, but it's because some of these patients have such an issue with their teeth when instead of being a teeth issue, it's a Bartonella issue and it's just affecting the teeth and the gums. And some of the conditions common in kids are um, something called oppositional defiant behaviors. Rage is common, sore throats that come and go. And, and these can be in adults and children, but they're especially common in children. Um, sore throats that come and go, and then swollen lymph, lymph nodes in the back of the neck is very common in children. Some people might have only one symptom. Some people might have more. It's different with every person. And a lot of things go into that. Um, if you have a very toxic body and you got bit by a tick when you were, say you're an adult now and you got bit by a tick when you were a child and it's been 20 years, you might have a very complex case of Bartonella. In that case, you may have way more symptoms. If somebody's had Bartonella for just a short time, they may only have one or two symptoms, but it's one of those illnesses that you wanna get on top of. And you want to find somebody who is literate in Bartonella, Lyme, and Babesia. All right. Excuse me for just a second. All right. So let's talk about testing for Bartonella. So testing is available, but many false negatives are given in the test. So most tests test for two, the two most common strains of Bartonella and most antibody testing produces a false negative due to Bartonella hiding intracellularly and it evades the immune system. So that's one of the advantages to Bartonella in hiding in a cell rather than outside the cell. The immune system has a hard time finding it. It's not good for us, it's good for it. Um, so some of the labs that, that we're familiar with, Igenix tests for two strains. Vibra America tests for a lot more strains than two, and we've used it with some success. And T-Lab is a new lab that we're learning about. And um, Dr. Robert Mazayeni is an internal medicine and rheumatology doctor, and he worked has worked with ILADS for many years. Um, he is a specialist in Bartonella and has recently started a lab. And in this lab, they look for the organism in the blood rather than looking for antibodies. It's the only lab I know that does that. Anyway, we, we plan on beginning to use that lab in the future. Um, one thing that's very important for Bartonella, just like it was for Lyme, is looking at the clinical picture. Regardless of what the testing shows, we have to look at the signs and symptoms that the person is having. Where have they traveled? 
What other symptoms do they have? Um, how long have they had those symptoms? Um, it, we look at the whole picture of the person um, and not just what the labs say. The labs are just one of the tools in, um, in determining if somebody is affected with Bartonella. All right, so what does treatment look like? Well, treatment varies greatly from practitioner to practitioner. Um, many doctors are not familiar with Bartonella and it often goes misdiagnosed and patients are treated then on a symptom by symptom basis. So in that case, oftentimes because the Bartonella is not being treated, the symptoms just get worse and worse, even though they're having treatment, they still, they just get worse and worse. Um, but when the practitioner recognizes Bartonella, they often use a combination therapy that uses at least two intracellular antibiotics, among other antibiotics, um, and usually use that for several months. And, um, you know, just like we do, they keep reviewing and see how symptoms are doing to determine if they need to use antibiotics longer. Some practitioners use herbal remedies and antibiotics, while others, like Foundations Wellness, uses herb only herbal remedies. All right, so what does it look like when you come to Foundations Wellness Coaching for a consultation? So when you come for your initial consultation, it's a 90-minute consultation so that we have a good amount of time to get a good picture of what's happening. We want to know all your symptoms. We want to know your background. What was your childhood like? We want to know where you've traveled. We want to know, are you an outdoors person? Could you have a tick bite? Have you been somewhere where there's sand flies, where that could be part of the picture? Um, and so during this consultation, we also do a Zyto scan. So a Zyto scan is bioenergetic scanning. And we use that to give us clues as to what things your immune system is prioritizing. Um, during well, Once the Zytoscan is finished, we do an ion cleanse foot bath, and we use this for full body detoxification. And we recommend those um, for each client, at least on a weekly basis, because they are go so good at drawing toxins out of the tissues. And, um, and during the consultation, I create a wellness plan. Now this plan is the place we're gonna start. And it contains, um, we, we talk about some different tools to, for improving health. So whether we're talking about detoxification or we're talking about gut health, say we're talking about the infections or biofilm, which is some of the places that the infections live. We might be talking about inflammation. We might be talking about emotional health. So um, on the wellness plan, <clears throat> excuse me, on the wellness plan, you're going to have um, some different tools and, and different suggestions for moving forward in your health. And with each consultation after that, they're 60 minutes long and we review, what did we talk about? What did we recommend in the wellness plan and what things have worked? What things haven't worked? What things do we need to adjust based on how you're doing? And um, again, we wanna get a full picture of how you're doing and then incorporate that into the next wellness plan. All right, so what are some of the things we do for Bartonella? Well, our most powerful tool is a liposomal essential oil formula. And I'm not sure if you've heard about these. Um, so in the past, the three practitioners here at Foundations Wellness Coaching did a webinar just on the lipo, liposomal essential oil for, formulas. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you would like to learn more about those, um, we have a YouTube page called Foundations Wellness Coaching, and you can learn a lot more. So I'll tell you a little bit about it, but the webinar is probably 45 minutes just on that alone. And we just wanted to share with people how powerful of a tool that is. Um, so a liposomal essential oil formula, of course, uses essential oils. And a liposome is a fat bubble that we spin the essential oils in. And they have a cellular membrane very similar to the cells in our body. Because of that, it's able to absorb into the tissues and into the cells and work at a cellular level. So the, the essential oil formulas, they can detox your cells, they can, they can nourish your cells, they can help 
things move into the cells and toxins to move out of the cells. It's one of the things we really love about this formula. And um, so when I did the webinar on Lyme disease, I talked about a study where they showed that essential oils worked even better than antibiotics for Lyme. Well, there is another study that I found on Bartonella and it didn't compare essential oils with antibiotics, but it talked about the effects of essential oils on Bartonella. And what the research, it was a research article in the journal Antibiotics, and they identified 32 different essential oils that are highly active against Bartonella hensley. And some of those oils include oregano, cinnamon bark, clove bud, allspice, geranium, among many others. And th some of these are the same as what they found for Lyme. So when we create an essential oil formula, we can go after Lyme and Bartonella at the same time. Um, another formula we use, another very potent and effective um, herb is Cryptolepis. And we also use some of the Byron White formulas and Cellcor formulas who all have some things specific for Bartonella. So depending on the patient or our client, it'll determine which herbal formulas we use. All right, and now I'd like to move into um, some things that can block recovery. So at, at Foundations Wellness Coaching, we have some pillars that we, we address with every client. So if somebody comes in with infections, we always address those. Um, we always work on detoxification because we know in the world that we live in, we are bombarded with toxins pretty much wherever we go. And so we want to teach you and give you some tools of how to reduce the toxins that are coming into your body. Um, we also talk a lot about gut health. And in my last webinar, um, I, I talked a lot about gut health also. So today I'm going to talk about PFAS, phthalates, and heavy metals. All right. So PFAS include a family of fluorinated chemicals that include nonstick, stain repellent, and waterproof properties. Uh, it is short for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, okay? They were introduced by DuPont in 1946 with Teflon and now includes thousands of consumer products. So if you look at this list, so it includes anything that is stain resistant. So think about your furniture and your carpet that are stain resistant. They include PFAS. Anything that is grease resistant, so fast food packaging, microwave popcorn bags, both of those contain PFAS. And when they're next to food, it leaches into the food. Um, Nonstick cookware, we know that that leaches into food. Um, personal care products can contain PFAS. Firefighting foams also. So if you live in a place, so we have a client who lives near a river that would combust, automatically combust. And firefighting, fire, the firemen came and sprayed foams there regularly and that leached into their drinking water and caused a lot of issues. Um, so firefighting foams, or if you're a firefighter, that could be something that you want to do some detoxing with. Um, paint can contain PFAS cosmetics, um, the chemicals in photography, and pesticides. So when you're spraying pesticides, you're putting PFAS um, in the air. Uh, okay, so due to the construction of the molecule, um, PFAS are known for never breaking down in the environment and they can remain in our bodies for years. They can contaminate water, soil, and they contaminate blood of people and animals. So um, I'm not sure if you've heard of the movie called Dark Waters. It's one I would recommend if you wanna learn more about PFAS. Um, it is a movie about a Cincinnati corporate defense attorney who was able to connect deaths in Parkersburg, West Virginia with the du DuPont Corporation. And it took many years and he really sacrificed his life 
to represent the people in West Virginia, but in the end he won. And um, it's a good movie to watch just for to get an education on PFAS. Um, so um, to the side, I have some of the things listed that um, that are affected by P PFAS. So a number of different cancers, um, reproductive issues, and childhood immunity is affected, birth weights affected, endocrine disruption increased cholesterol and weight gain. So and when we talk about endocrine disruption, we're talking about the glands that create our hormones and our hormones are used to help our bodies maintain balance, um, temperature, hunger. It, 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 um, it helps our bodies, um, it helps control the communication in our bodies. And if, if, the, if our hormones are not healthy, just think about pairing this with Bartonella, with Bartonella having to do with depression and increased crying and rage. So if end, our endocrine system is disrupted, which can also include those things, just think how much more we could be experiencing those. So PFAS are one of the things um, we want to learn how to recognize and how to reduce in our lives. All right, next we're gonna talk about phthalates. Phthalates are chemicals used to make plastic more durable, known as plasticizers, and some are used to dissolve other materials. They're used in hundreds of products. So some of the places that they're found are um, chip resistant nail polish, anything with a fragrance. Think about the fragrances in the personal care products you use. Your shampoo, your soap, body lotion, deodorant, laundry detergent, dryer sheets, cleaning products, anything that has fragrance on the label contains phthalates, okay? So if it's any fragrance other than essential oils, it's something you wanna begin replacing with something that's natural, something that uses essential oils or has no fragrance at all. Um, kitchen plastics have phthalates in them. Um, vinyl toys for children have phthalates. Craft paint, consumer products made of vinyl. Some of these might include lawn furniture, garden hoses, flooring, or a shower curtain. If you have a vinyl shower curtain, my recommendation is in the next couple days, go to the store and buy a cloth shower curtain. They're very easy to find. Um, when the vinyl gets warm, phthalates, the fumes of phthalates come off. And so you're breathing that in with your shower. We don't want to do that. Um, air fresheners. How many of you have a Glade plug-in in your house? Or you have one of those things hanging from your car that is a deodorizer? Um, both of those contain phthalates. Um, some cosmetic and personal care products. Personal care products such as menstrual pads and diapers um, contain phthalates. Now, I, I'm not sure, I mean, when my two oldest kids were babies, we used cloth diapers. Most people aren't into using cloth diapers these days, um, but it is an option. Um, I'm not sure how, if you can find phthalate free diapers, but it's definitely something to look into. Um, I think I'm gonna look into that for my grandchildren. Now, so what are some of the health ris risks of phthalates? Again, phthalates are a major endocrine disruption. So they disrupt the organs that create our hormones that keep a balance in our body. Um, so that can affect fertility, can affect puberty. Excuse me again. All right. Um, it can affect birth weight, um, the weight of adults, including obesity. It can affect diabetes. Um, it can cause immune system dysregulation. Um, it causes, it's related to some cancers and also neurological and behavior problems. So think about this. If you have PFAS in your body, 
and phthalates in your body, and you're dealing with Bartonella, how much more those symptoms could be exaggerated because of the toxins in your body. That's why we always deal with detoxification with each client. I mean, all of us that work here, we're, we're working on detoxification for ourselves because we're all exposed to toxins daily. So what we want to, for each of us to learn is how do we reduce what's coming into our body? And that's some of the things, some of the tools we give you at Foundations Wellness Coaching. Excuse me again. All right, so the last type of chemicals I wanna to talk, to, talk to you about are heavy metals. Okay, um, according to Dr. Stephen Cabral, who is the author of The Rain Barrel Effect, he says that heavy metals wreak havoc on our bodies at a cellular level, and they cause massive inflammation as well, triggering autoimmunity um, and other diseases while placing us at risk for a complete domino effect of diseases to follow. When heavy metals are stored in your body, it can affect every body system. And um, we're gonna start with mercury. So mercury is one of the most toxic heavy metals damaging both our brains and our body. It can be found in some very common items. Contact lens solution, nasal sprays, prescription drugs, vaccines and flu shots in the past always had mercury in them. I think they switched from mercury to aluminum, but aluminum is toxic to us also. So vaccines and flu shots have that added toxin in them. Um, fungicides, pesticides, and fertilizers can contain mercury, as well as industrial smokestacks like you see in this picture. The runoff from them can affect soil, air, and our oceans. So if you see eat certain types of fish, they can be filled with mercury. Another common exposure is silver amalgam dental fillings. Every time you chew, microdoses of mercury are being released in your bloodstream and in your digestive tract. So about a year and a half ago, I decided to have my, my metal amalgams removed. And so um, something that is really important, and I was really glad I waited until I was educated, and I learned that you need to find a holistically trained biological dentist who has special education, special training to remove mercury amalgams. It is so toxic to remove them that if you remove them incorrectly, you can be more sick than having them in. So let me describe what it might look like just to give you an idea. So the dentist and the hygienist are covered from head to toe to protect themselves from the mercury. As a patient, I was also covered head to toe. I had a cap on, I had a gown that went down to my feet and, I, and my feet, shoes were covered. I had goggles on. I had an oxygen mask on my nose. They were working on my mouth and I had a guard in my mouth to protect the other parts of my mouth from the mercury. And then I had a tube that was very close to my mouth that went out and this sucked any fumes of mercury that would come from my mouth as they were removing the amalgams. It looked a lot like a Dr. Seuss picture. That's the only, th only other way I could describe it. But each of those safety precautions is used because mercury is so toxic. Um, on the reference page, I have a, a line um, that has information on how to find a biological dentist um, if you have mercury amalgams and you wanna think about getting those removed. Um, so mercury is a neurotoxin affecting brain function. It's linked with chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, muscle pain, tinnitus, memory and concentration problems, tingling and numbness, autoimmunity and impaired immune function. Um, there's really not 
one good thing about mercury when it comes to our bodies. So it's really important for us to recognize if we're getting it in our bodies and to learn how to detox from it. And that's what some of the things that we do here at Foundations Wellness Coaching. And um, so next I want to talk about lead. Um, so like other heavy metals, lead is very neurotoxic and it can damage every area of our body, every organ system. Exposure can lead to birth defects, seizures, learning disabilities, permanent brain damage, hearing loss, high blood pressure, kidney damage, miscarriage, and premature birth. It's really serious side effects. Um, so before 1978, homes and buildings um, could be could have lead-based paint being used in them. Um, so if you have a home or a building that is was painted before that time, you might have lead-based paint in your home or in your in your place of employment. Um, it can also be found in pipes. Um, it is found in ammunition. So if you're somebody who goes to the gun range, um, you would you would have some exposure to lead. Um, it can be found in the ground in the groundwater, in soil, in pottery. Um, if you ever find pottery um, at a thrift store. If it doesn't say food safe, just know that it may have lead in it. So um, one of my nieces in college did, she she was an artist and she worked on pottery. And she said some of the her classmates would, um, they didn't want their pottery and um, and it was sent to the thrift store or, or to the Goodwill um, without the notice that it was made with lead. So any pottery made with lead, of course, is not meant for food. So just as a warning there. Um, let's see, where else can we find it? We can find it in crafts, um, in construction material and cosmetics, including face paint. A lot of the face paint used for um, Halloween, used for painting your kids' faces, contain lead. So you want to want to use things that are safe. Um, lipstick, some lipsticks contain lead, uh, mascara, blush, eyeshadow, and it can also be found in hair dyes. All right, so lastly, I wanna talk about fluoride, chlorine, and bromide. So I'm talking about these three together because they all affect iodine. Um, these three, along with iodine and astatine, are halogens, and this is a group of elements on the periodic table. So if you go look at a periodic table, you'll see fluoride, chlorine, bromide, iodine, and then astatine, all in one column. Um, fluoride, chlorine, and bromide have the ability to push iodine out of the cells, causing hypothyroidism and many other effects. So fluoride can be found in drinking water, can be found in toothpaste and other dental products, and in nonstick pans where Teflon is used. Chlorine is found in drinking water, in processed foods, and in some swimming pools. Bromide, bromides are in all plastic wraps and plastic bottles, and especially if you heat it up, the bromide would be uh, leached into the food. Um, it's found in pesticides and food additives such as potassium, bromide, and bread, and other baked goods. It is an ingredient in, um, in flame retardants in clothes, furniture, and carpeting. Okay. All cells in the body use iodine, especially our brain and the central nervous system, our skin and our, our digestive system and our endocrine system. It is a crucial element for our bodies. Low thyroid function is linked to chronic illness such as rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, MS, um, many autoimmune and neurological conditions, asthma, allergies, migraines, neuropathies, among other conditions. So guys, um, I just want you to know that I'm not telling you any of this to scare you, but to empower you to make better decisions. If we know that heavy metals can be an issue, then you can seek help in learning how to detox from those elements. And that is some of the things that we do here at Foundations Wellness Coaching. Um, with every person that comes in, we look to see what kind of things are issues for you for, for as far as toxins go. And we learn that from our 
90 minute consultation and our six minute, 60 minute consultations. We talk about a lot of different things so that we can empower you to make decisions and empower you to make changes for de to detox your body. Um, now I'm gonna turn it back over to Justine. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so as Lisa is taking a little bit of time to go through the questions that you all have sent, um, and if you haven't sent any now is a good time to do that, but as she's taking a little bit of time, I want to, um, do a few more housekeeping things. One, this reference page that you see right here, um, for the different articles and books and research that, uh, Lisa referenced tonight, we'll be sending that out in the follow-up email as well. Um, so you guys can go ahead and check out some of those resources for yourself, um, another thing um, is that, as we mentioned before, this is part two of a three-part webinar. Um, Lisa, you want to go ahead and hit that next slide yes, for me? I sure will. Thank you. So the next one is coming up on February 6th, so another Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock. Um, and that one will be talking about beating Babesia. So possible Lyme, Bartonella, Babesia, talking about mystery illness or autoimmune illness and detoxification again, um, all the different parts and the ins and outs of Babesia. And Lisa will be hosting that one for us as well. Um, so you go ahead and mark your calendars for that. We'll send out a reminder if you're already on the email list for that as well. Um, Lisa already gave a good snapshot of what an initial consultation looks like and um, what that would entail if you choose to work with us at all. Um, and if you have any friends or loved ones that you think this might benefit, feel free to have them even just call our office. Our front office staff is wonderful and they are great at answering any of the questions you may have. Um, and we can also do a brief um, phone call with the practitioner as well, just to ask some basic questions, just to see if you would maybe be a good fit in working with us. Um, and our practitioners, I often say, one of the things that sets them apart is not only are they incredibly knowledgeable, they have some of the time and resources to keep digging and researching and training and just really expanding their knowledge and all these things, but they are also some of the most compassionate people um, that you will meet, which is a huge blessing when you are somebody who's been struggling to figure out why you feel so awful. If you're somebody who's struggling to find a practitioner who's Lyme literate and actually knows the ins and outs of this really complicated disease. Um, it's really nice to have somebody who's understanding and compassionate. Um, and I know from personal experience that all these ladies really are. Um, so I'm going to hand it back over to Lisa now for um, answering some questions and then we will wrap things up for the evening. All right. Thank you so much, Justine. I have some really good questions here. So the first question, um, if you have Lyme disease, does that automatically mean you have Bartonella? No, no. We, we've had lots of clients that have just had Lyme disease. Um, you can also just have Bartonella or you can also just have Babesia. So even if you can have one you can have two or you can have three. So um, when we do our consultations, um, we that's why we ask so many questions. Okay. We want to we want to look at what symptoms are you having and and where where does it line up? Does it line up more like Lyme? Does it line up more like Bartonella, more like Babesia? And then that's also why we offer testing as part of the clinical picture. All right, so number two, is Bartonella something you can ever completely rid of your body? Um, I'm gonna say um, most likely, even if you have all the treatment in the world, you, you will probably still have some in your body. The, what we do here is we want to get your body into a place where it can take care of the Bartonella or the Lyme that's in your body. So as practitioners, we believe that half to three fourths of all people in America probably have Lyme in their body, but their immune system is able to stay on top of it for most people. So for those that it can't stay on top of, then they begin to have symptoms of Lyme, Bartonella, or Babesia. So, um, but we, you can live with it in your body. You just, we just want your immune system to be able to stay on top of it. So that's what we work on with you. Um, set the, another question is what would be the first two toxins you would focus on removing from your home? All right, so one thing I would do is decide what products you wanna change. 
And then as you run out of them, replace them with something non-toxic. Unless, I mean, you can go and you can just get rid of them all and replace them all. Um, so if I was going to replace, if I was going to change one thing, I would change my water. Okay. I would drink the cleanest water I could. So does that mean um, uh, one thing you could do is, is get a zero water pitcher? If you didn't want to make it an initial investment right now, you could do a zero water pitcher. And that's a, a pitcher that on the environmental working group, it was named the top pitcher for removing the most toxins. Um, reverse osmosis water is good. Distilled water is good. And if you're concerned about um, minerals, it's very easy to add minerals to that water. Um, the, the, um, so the, if I was going to change one thing, I would change water. But as far as toxins, think about the things you put on your skin. Those are the things you're absorbing the most. Okay. So um, your lotions, I, I make my own lotion. I have for probably 30 years made my own recipe is a little different every time, um, but it's clean. It's something I could eat. It's stuff that I could use in the kitchen. Um, so things that come on your body or just decide one by one, as I run out of something, I'm going to replace it with something that is non-toxic. And um, a, a good resource for that is the environmental working group. And um, there is a site skin deep that has all products that go on your skin and um, the regular, the if you go to just Environmental Working Group or EWG, um, that gives you information on water because it's te they've tested all the water so they can give you information on the water where you live. Um, they also have um, all kinds of information on food and they have a um, something called uh, the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15 lists. And now that it's 2024, they'll probably be coming out with a new list. Um, but these are the foods that, so the dirty dozen is the most contaminated food as far as pesticides, insecticides, and herbicides. Clean 15 are the ones that are the cleanest. And um, so I, I think I've answered your question. And if not, um, I have a web, I have my own website, Lisa at foundationswellnesscoaching.com. Feel free to email me if you, if I didn't answer that question well enough. Um, okay, I really like this last question. Is there any specific toxin that is linked to making Babesia, or I'm sorry, Bartonella worse? Okay, I wouldn't say a specific toxin. It has more to do with your toxic load. Okay, so what we find is people with the highest toxic load, and remember, toxins are not just chemicals, but they can also be emotions. Okay. That's a big part. A toxic emotion that sits in your body somewhere that hasn't been dealt with is just as toxic as a chemical. Okay. So the people who have the hardest time with Lyme and Bartonella are the people who have the most toxins. So as we give them tools and they begin to reduce their toxic load, their body gets to the point where it can finally begin fighting the Bartonella or the Lyme disease. So that's why it's always one of the pillars here at Foundations Wellness Coaching of um, getting that toxic load down. All right, everyone, that there we come to the end of our webinar. Thank you so much for joining me today. And um, this will be put on our YouTube channel like the others. And so if you have anybody who you think might be possibly um, experiencing Lyme, Bartonella, or Babesia, which is coming next month, um, please refer them to our, to our channel and, um, and give them our information. Thank you so much for joining me. We'll see you next time.